Okay, uh, welcome to Rolling Out, and we have the most prestigious guest here today, uh, Ms. Raymond Simone, who's an, who's an icon and a cultural trendsetter and someone who has, I don't know, I guess your accomplishments are not just laudable, they're, they're, it's unprecedented. Like, you go, it's already hard, as we've seen over the years, for child stars to make the maturation process into adulthood, but then to, it seemed like it's been so seamless. I know that's what it seems from the outside, but I want you to talk about these historical benchmarks that you have accomplished in terms of, you know, 100 episodes of the current uh, show, um, and then what, 200 episodes of uh, your character, Raven. And I just wanted to, you know, congratulate you and have you to talk about what it's like to understand and kind of come to grips with what you have accomplished in your career. Uh, I'm going to be 100. I don't always come to grips with what I accomplished in my career. It's not something that I think about on an everyday. I normally think about it when somebody brings it up and I'm like, oh yeah, I have been working for that long. But um, I've been very fortunate in my career to have um, some major milestones. The youngest person to sign with NCA Records, um, you know, youngest black female to have a show named after her. And then that show going to 200 episodes within that character and vice versa. Um, directing, producing, and all of these things. And it, for me, it's just a constant movement of what I feel like my career should have, what my resume should have. And like I said, I rarely just look back and be like, dang. And, um, you know, I'm working on that. That's what meditation is for, you know, but I'm very grateful for all the opportunities that I have said yes to and all the people that I've been able to work with over the years to keep my choo-choo train going. Uh, there's definitely been moments in this lifetime where you, I could care less. Um, I didn't want to be here in the sense of I retired for a few years and, you know, my entire life has been known. I have no anonymity whatsoever and will never have it. So yeah, there are things <laughs> that I- You've accepted there, that. I've, I've sacrificed a lot to be here, um, but at the same time, calling it a sacrifice is- in a way saying that I had it before and I never had it. So I didn't sacrifice anything. I just never had it. Um, and I'm okay with that. I've learned so much and my future is bright because of it. And I can move forward and tackle other goals. I, what I wanted to know, one of the things I wanted to know, because there's so many things is one, maintaining relevancy for a long, for an extended period of time. That's hard for any type of entertainer, whether it's a singer, dancer, um, athlete, actress, actor, that is extremely hard. First of all, the business is extremely hard, extremely glamorous from the outside looking in. We on TV. Outside looking in. Yeah, I, I look at Janet, for example, um, and I see it looks so glamorous and so, you know, it, it seems so seamless and so painless. That's not the case. You know, Mal, we know better. You knew better back then. So how did you navigate that process into adulthood to where now it's like you still have the pulse of America? Like you, you're still tackling topics. People remain in love with you where it withers with most actors and actresses, especially when you start in childhood. Have you ever thought about that? Or what do you attribute that to? Never thought about it, actually. And a thought came up while you asked me that question. I think I have the secret. I think I got the secret. You stick with the kids. Um, <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like for the last, um, I see I started that. So right when I was 15 years old and I'm 36 now. So I don't do math very fast. So those years I've really been um, in front of the pupils of nine to 14 year olds, even though I'm 36 years old. So I'm very fortunate to be able to be a part of humans lives at a young age to where when they grow up, they're like, I watched you, I watched you. Um, and that kind of mirrors my life. You know, I started in the industry when I was 16 months old and a part of kind of iconic shows. But I think it really is because of Disney Channel of the Walt Disney Company and my love for family comedy. Um, and, you know, Listen, I did The View because I wanted people to see me as an adult uh, in accordance with, you know, how I thought. And then some people changed their career to be seen as an adult in other ways. 
that I personally don't feel comfortable doing in myself. And because I went a different route to show my adulthood, I think I was able to come back to such a family template Mm -hmm. and um, recreate fun stories, bring together amazing actors and help to mold the minds of the young generation as we come up. So I think that's, I just thinking about it now, it's like, I, yeah, I have been relevant, but I'm relevant because I stick with the kids. You know what I mean? Each generation, hopefully you see a little bit of me when you grow up and then your grandparents will know me when I was three. And then you guys can communicate about, you know, what I've been doing since then. So it's, it, it warms my heart. And it's also really interesting on the street because I'll be walking down the street and the grandparent will be with the great grandchild or the grandchild and then the parent and the grandma will be like, I don't remember you as Olivia. And I go, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. <laughs> and then the little kid will be like, Raven, I'll be like, hey, what's up? So it's like, I have to like change this energy because they're so used to uppity. And, um, but it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun to see the generations uh, enjoy the work that I work so hard to do. Yes, exactly. And that's a good segue to my next point because um, you're telling an intergenerational story um, and you're behind the scenes. So it's kind of interesting. You're telling you're telling a story now from the perspective of a parent. Um, when you started, like you said, you started so young on a an, on an iconic show and then moved to, onto your own material. Now you've progressed and evolved into producing and directing. And I wanted to know that's that's a lot of hats. That's a lot of responsibility. How has that gone so far? Um, we know it's still wildly successful, but uh, in terms of how you approach things and how the toll it might take on you. Well, I cannot ever answer that question without shining the truth light on the people who have helped me get who have helped me get here within the um, Raven Baxter brand community. All the EPs that we have worked with, all of Disney Channel. Um, all of the cast members that have come in. Yes, I direct, act, and produce, but I can do all of that. And if I don't have those people, I'm just going to be sitting at home saying I'm doing something and nobody can see it. So even though I hold those hats, none of them are solely held by me. This is a communal effort. This is a family that we've created. And I would not, it's literally impossible for me to do it without them. And I think that's one thing that I try to pass on to my my cast and crew, it's like, listen, I'll learn my lines barely. And then you guys, you <laughs> you got to take care of everything else. And we will make this collaboration of creativity. And that's what it is. So with anybody who's like, yes, you know, this, this job is hard. It's just so much stress. Yes, there is stress. Yeah. But if you manage correctly and if you allow others to shine within your light, your light only gets bigger. And that's what I want. I want to see people succeed. There have been so many upgrades to people's titles during the progression of Raven's Home and That's So Raven, meaning PAs, becoming switchers, becoming stage managers, um, you know, writers, becoming directors, actors doing this. And that's what's important because you're passing it forward. So yes, it's stressful. Yes, it's not dangerous. Yes, it's a business, but I do it with so many people and we all hold the stress together and that's, it's easier that way. Yes. And I guess it, um, your combined community, um, all the people that, um, you know, evolve around you or working with you, help you to tackle some of these titles in, in, um, on the show that are very, very, (laughs) very relevant. Um, I wanted to talk about a couple of them, uh, in particular, um, what is it called? Styling and profiling. Um, Yeah where your co-star Isaac uh, Ryan Brown, um, you know, has to have that interaction uh, with the police, which we know, um, which we know has not always been pleasant uh, between the police and the POC. So just wanted to talk about some of these type, uh, some of these subject matter that is both relevant, but put in a way that is digestible by many people. I think that's the ultimate um, equation, right? truth, respect, palatable, tolerable for a younger age bracket. So starting off, we have a wonderful set of EPs, Anthony Hill, Jed, Scott, Robin, who understand how important it is to 
reflect society in comedy slash even kids comedy in a way where I like to say a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Uh, corny and I like it. And so Disney Channel understood this as well. So as we went like this to all the problems that are going on in America, you know, landing on this was obvious. Yes. It is a show casted um, with all the POCs. We have, you know, first American, first American born Chinese. We have Latino, we have mixed, we have everybody. So when they presented this topic, we all said this has to happen. Now, like you said, it's the process of creating something that's tolerable, something that's not uber scary. We have that enough in the news, yes. but also getting the point across so that people can understand and have conversations later. And I, again, have to give it to the writers of that episode, Anthony Hill. Um, he really understood it. He's a black man himself. We had multiple people from s &P and communities come in and scan the document and make sure that we are touching on a, a teaching moment and a reflection moment and all of that. I also directed the episode and really had to um, shield myself from my emotions because mm. watching Isaac Ryan Brown play Booker go through this traumatic experience as so many people in this country have um, I I felt icky it's just not okay what he had to go through yeah. and we can we all know what the real deal is in America and that's it it's not, it's incorrect. It's right. It's incorrect. So one of the things that we wanted to make sure in this episode was, you know, Booker does something amazing. He sees the cops come. He says, okay, what did mom tell me to do? Put my hands on the wheel, get my license out. Like the protocol that not every culture has to go through when getting pulled over by the cops. Right. He went through that. Yeah. And, um, you know, thank God he was uh, saved by his grandfather and they talk later. I think it's a really powerful conversation that they have the two generations um, experiencing things like this and how we're progressing, but the remnants of disgust is still there. Yeah. Um, I think that this episode will create a conversation within communities that are not um black or people of color when they watch the show we're very fortunate to have all kinds of colors watch our show oh, and absolutely. if you're you know what i mean and if your culture has not experienced that right you're watching the show you've grown up with booker you've grown up with raven baxter and you don't want to see any bad happen to them so i think that can help start the conversation because let's not forget you you aren't born with a hateful heart no so that has to be taught and in every good person, it can be untaught. You just have to go through it. You have to feel the empathy. You have to say, hey, that's not fair. My brother's going through something. My friend is going through something. And if we can say, even if you don't have a friend that went through it and you see that Booker went through it, he's your friend as well. So do something about it. Help us change the narrative. And uh, I spoke so much, so I'm gonna be quiet now. No, no, no. That, I mean, that was beautiful, actually. It was very eloquent. And uh, you know what I'm saying? I'm glad that you went ahead and elaborated on the process of what you went through. Um, you try to tell the truth, but in a way that is, you know, that consumers can actually digest it in a way that they learn something to go along with the, the laughs that, that take place in the show or the comedy in the show. You know, a, a lot of times comedy is the best way to convey things that are going on. I mean, we got Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock and the rest, you know, so many others who do that very, very well. So I'm glad that you went ahead and elaborated on that. I also wanted to touch upon the fact that, you know, um, your positioning, it seems like there's also a way in which you're providing a platform for other people who have, uh, who are gifted uh, to provide or to, I don't know, I guess provide a pathway into increasing um, that are not just diversity and inclusion, but to make it reflect a little bit more to what it really goes on in America. Um, um, the reflect America, not just one demographic. Uh, we don't live in a homogeneous society, so therefore TV should not be that way. So I wanted you to talk about um, your uh, 
uh, can it's not a campaign. It's just something that you have been consciously working towards and that you are providing a platform now because uh, thankfully your show has been monstrously successful for a long time. Like That's So Raven was one of the greatest shows in the history of Disney. You know, it's just like, so that you have a platform to do that. So I wanted you to talk about um, your, mental, your your philosophy of um, in creating more opportunities for just for just more people, period. So yes, thank you so much for saying that. I appreciate it. Um, I live in America. I'm an American. Right. And when I look around, I see every human that lives on this planet in this country. Yes. Every single color, every single person. I can feel connected to those other people that look different than me in a way where I'm like, we're Americans. Like I take a little bit of every culture and put it into my everyday because I'm surrounded by that. Why shouldn't the television shows do the same thing? Plain and simple. If I'm watching television, it's to reflect what I see. I My next door neighbors are Korean, Indian, Bangladeshi. I mean, I have everything around me, right? So it's like, I don't understand, anyway. So right. yes, it is very important that that happens for me in my career. However, I wouldn't be able to do this uh, if it wasn't for the network I am on. Yes. Disney Channel, the Disney company have worked so hard to have inclusion um, in their, you know, storylines. I mean, if you look at Disney Plus, one of the shows that I'm super excited about is American Born Chinese. You okay. know, High School Musical, the musical, the musical, television show, the musical movie. It's too long of a title. <laughs> Inclusion. It's like, why not reflect what right. we actually live on an everyday basis? What does that do? Is it an agenda? Yeah, it's an agenda. The agenda is to see yourself. Right. When I was growing up, I didn't see myself. I didn't see a oversized, light-skinned black girl who was questioning her sexuality in a comedy. It just didn't happen. No. And if it did, it was like fourth, it didn't happen, okay? Right. Just right. it was an audience. It wasn't, it was always either the best friend or the audience. So it feels amazing to be able to be a part of change, to be a part of the conversation of, listen, our cast and crew, mandatory. I wanna see everybody. Yeah. because I want to. Now, here's the kicker, right? Okay. We go through a casting and we're hiring and I have to like, okay, can't do, you can't do you. And they're like, we don't have what you're looking for because there's not enough people in that category with a different color or sex background. I'm like, right. yeah, because you guys wouldn't let them, not you guys, no, but, you know, the, the, the world at B just did not allow for that education for those people at yeah. this time now that I can hire them. So it's fun because like one of the girls in our show, she started off as a um, COVID tester. And I was like, what do you want to do? She's like, I want to be behind the camera. I said, come on, you're gonna be, you gotta, you know what I mean? We have to start bringing in more people so that those jobs can actually be filled. Cause I just don't want to fill jobs with people of color that don't have the education. You have to teach them. You know what I mean? We still got to make a good product. You know what I mean? You got to go to school. For it. No, absolutely. So absolutely. I'm, Super excited to be a part of a company that's like, we need to find these people. We need to find people outside of our normal vision of the human and get these POCs, LGBTQ plus community, all of the things and give them opportunities because can you imagine the creativity more, even more because it's actually the country's really doing well with it. Yeah. But when you bring all of those cultures together, you get a better product you get so many different views. You're like, yeah. oh snap. Okay, let me marinate this meat real quick. I can put some soy sauce in it. Let me put some turmeric in it, some crystals hot sauce, and then undercut it with some lemongrass. Honey, yeah. I wouldn't know about that if I didn't bring all my cultures together. You know what I mean? So I get excited. Well, absolutely. And, 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 you, and you have reason to be because when I juxtapose what I'm seeing these days uh, from television, streaming, movies, to what we saw when we, you and I were both little kids in the 1980s, it was an anomaly to have a black show on major primetime television. And it was alone, it was by itself. Now, um, and you were there, you were there on that show and now you're here and you're one of many. And so I know you're, there's a sense of gratitude 
that that has taken place, that it has evolved to that. You know what else trips me out? I'll be watching a YouTube a lot and different commercials and stuff. But when I see the mixed couples in like a Febreze ad. Oh, I see that. Or, yes, yes. Or the gay couple in like a raid ad. I'm right. like, what is this? Is this America? Right. Like, it's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. well, it's America. It's, uh, it's the best. Yes, it yeah. is. It is. It is a uh, definite substantial improvement from what we saw in the 1980s. And so, yeah, and, 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 I, and think I think it's, and I think it's important because, you know, we can always complain about what's not happening. Right. We can always do that. And normally right. that gives high, um, that headlines. But what I love that you just did is give gratitude for what has happened because you shine a light on it, more will come. So yes, I, even though we got things to change, I am so proud of Hollywood. I am so proud of the people with voices standing up, boycotting, changing the narrative, changing the dynamics, making companies think twice about hiring the same, but at the same time, giving everybody a chance to shine. Because it's not right. about exclusion. It's not about you can't come here anymore. It's just like, share Remember that in kindergarten? Let's share. That's all that needs to happen. And I'm so proud of us. And again, it's important to you know, nowadays they say this generation is like toxic positivity slash snowflake generation. But what they're saying is give praise to when you do good. When I grew up, they were like, if you're doing the right thing, you shouldn't be getting praise for it. <laughs> it's like, yes, I should. So I'm, I'm happy for us. Yes, it, it, exactly. And I'm very pleased. I'm very heartened by the commercials as well, because I've noticed, I've definitely have noticed uh, the different hues, the different ethnicities, uh, in the commercials, uh, the different sexual orientations, I've seen it. And I have been pleasantly surprised. I was like, where did that come from? And why did they do this when we were kids? But then I'm just glad that it's happening at all. Yeah. So in closing, um, as we're uh, being told that we're running out of time, I wanted to talk, give you an opportunity to talk about what's going moving forward uh, with the show, uh, Raven's Home. And, um, and, and, and you know, you, you have three generations on one television program, which is which is also unique. So I want you to talk about that and some of the things that your audience, your fans, your multitude of fans uh, can look forward to for the rest of the season. And, and well, yeah, for sure. Um, season five, there's so many more nostalgic stories coming up, so many more um, social topics being brought up. I have to just put a little thing, and we have four generations on this show. We have little Mimi, who's 10 years old, Isaac, myself, and Rondell, and being able to see that dynamic of ages come together to um, to overcome a challenge or to communicate with each other from long lines of education and even learning from the youngest always works. Uh, very, very proud of the work that we've put in for this show for this season. Uh, the writers, the executive producers, and like I said a little bit earlier, just seeing the, the growth of our crew and cast um, rise titles and, and do better in their lives. Um, we got picked up for a sixth season and the writers are in the room right now coming up with amazing storylines uh, that we hopefully will be able to share with everyone and um, bring some more nostalgic back. Again, it's always about making sure that we can reflect what our country is going through. Um, you're, whoever's watching, we wanna make sure you see yourself in some way and um, to tackle topics that are current, that matter to our crew of people as well as yourself and to just touch the hearts. You know, laughter is the best medicine, a spoonful yes. of sugar medicine go down. I've been doing comedy for the last 35 years. I wouldn't have it any other way. And we have some talented cast members in this show from uh, Michael Michelle to Alex to Emmy to Rondell and Isaac. And, being able to help them shine within their career is ultimately, ultimately my goal. Like I love acting. That's great. But what I really love is, is helping people rise. Yeah. Here. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you for taking a few minutes, uh, not only to uh, discuss the show and your view of Hollywood and how things are, have evolved, but also to, uh, to, to uh, give me some, uh, some health tips um, in terms of, we have a we have a minute um, you, because you cannot you cannot uh, thrive in this country in any sector of society without good health. So I wanted to give it a quick opportunity about how how do you maintain your health and the things that you've picked up over the years um, in terms of maintaining your health in order to continue to drive forward. 
now you're talking my language. Let's talk about it. I have been every size in the book from 210 pounds to 115 pounds. It's been a hot mess. Why? Because I gave in to the dogma of what food is supposed to be or what's good for you. And a lot of the time, it's just companies doing it so that they can get paid. Ultimately, what I do now, I do, I'm an intermittent faster. I'm also a faster. And that may seem a little, whoa, what's going on? But ultimately, the human is not supposed to eat 24 hours of the day. It's not supposed to. You have to give your digestive system a rest. So 12 hours, no eating. And that's when you go to sleep. Super easy. Um, I'm also low carb because ultimately your body can create carbs to, to, to live. It doesn't necessarily need a burger, the bun. And also I read the labels. Also, my wife taught me this, like reading the label, you'll be surprised how much sugar is added into things slash Absolutely. a lot of things that we intake are manufactured. They're not whole foods. Black seed oil, one of the best things that you'll ever come across. I wrote that down and too. Write it down. Um, it's amazing that for, you know, in the seventies, the weight of humans were, was much better managed. And then it started to change. There were a lot of fads, low fat, uh, no, sh like all kinds of stuff. And it just tipped the scales of what our human body can actually handle. So ultimately good food, meaning food that grows from the ground. You don't need to inject sugar into a pineapple because it's already sweet. You know what I mean? So I don't understand. Um, and you got this, like, I, it's daunting, right? Because we get into this lethargic stage because of all this toxins in our body. Right. And we, I remember when I was my 200, I was like, I'm not going to exercise until I lose enough weight because I can't even move. I ate correctly. I ate, <laughs> I don't know where you're from, but I'm from the South and it's from the Ruta to the Tuta. It's like, you eat your, you eat it. <laughs> okay. Right. And, um, right. and you just don't stuff that's packaged stay on the outside of the grocery line you'll be amazed which because we're healing humans our bodies can heal themselves you just have to give it the time to exactly well thank you so much um our time is up but i have thoroughly enjoyed this and hopefully within a year or two uh when we do this again i could do it in person um so i can get a picture with you and put it on my little uh thing yeah exactly oh yeah so thank I'll you i'll try so to much. wear the same striped shirt as janet <laughs> okay exactly okay cool cool well, God bless you and the rest of your family, your wife, um, the rest of your family and the show. And, uh, we, you know, say, and blessings to all that you do moving forward. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Sherry. I really appreciate you. I love the conversation. I can't wait to do it again. Thank you. God bless. God bless.